appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here this evening and to do a program that I really enjoy. It's one of my favorites. Um, my own background, for those of you who obviously most of you don't know me, I'm sure. Uh, my name is Steve Cicero. Incidentally, I hope my voice is not going to get any gravelier because sometimes it does that, but I've got a cough drop handy in case it does. Uh, 38 years teaching in the Butler School District, and so retired a few years ago and decided to continue doing this. And so over those few years since then, uh, basically I go anywhere to find opportunities to share stories about local history, national history, whatever. And in doing so, I kind of harken back to the days of depression when people would travel all over the country to get jobs, whatever they could do. And so I became the history hobo, which is where I get the hat. And that is my, my new identity. I will now remove my hat because my mother told, taught me many years ago that you don't wear a hat inside a building. And so uh, we'll remove that. But in any case, uh, also, I was known for my hats and uh, also known for outfits occasionally. Uh, you may notice I am I am channeling my inner Fred Rogers right now because, of course, he is the namesake of the program. So what we're going to do is I am going to start from the beginning. And I just want to double check I'm not seeing all of a sudden. Why am I not seeing anything on my screen? I know you're not seeing it. By the way, let me go to the second uh, <laughs> second slide. Um, so can you guys see this? Nobody's seeing only it? You. We can only see you. not coming through yet. Okay. So hang on there. Maybe I did not screen share. There we go. Okay. Now, from the current slide, how are we doing? Is that better? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So there's my contact information. <clears throat> That'll be at the end, too. Uh, if anybody has an interest in a program, please feel free to get in touch. Tonight, we are talking about Fred Rogers and other famous neighbors. And I want to emphasize the second part of that title, the subtitle, because the first time I did this, uh, Fred comes near the end of the program. So a little preview warning there. And my wife asked me afterwards, like, I kept waiting for Fred Rogers. Well, I just thought it was a clever title. OK, but it's really about all kinds of other people in addition to Fred Rogers. You can see some of them there on your screen. Uh, anybody want to unmute and tell me if you know any of those four people besides Fred Rogers on the screen right there? You're welcome to do that. Anyone want to give a shout out to any of those? Hmm? Maybe you don't recognize Andy them. Warhol. Andy Warhol, top left. Anyone else? Nellie hmm. Bly. Nellie Bly, top right. Good one. Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, bottom left. And Jonas Salk. Jonas Salk. We got it. Four for four. All right. We've got a uh, crowd here that's very knowledgeable. So hopefully that's a good thing. So let's continue with the program then. Uh, what we have in store for you here is a program that focuses on people who were either or both born or they gained fame here in Western Pennsylvania. Most of them born here, but not everybody. Now, we could talk about all the industrial titans who are household names here in Western Pennsylvania and, frankly, across the country, like the Carnegies and the Westinghouses and the Mellons and so on. We're not going to do that. We could talk about all the sports stars. That's a whole program in itself. We're not going to do that either. So what we're going to do is, instead of those people who would fit under this rubric here, we're going to talk about mostly those who are involved in science and military activities and also arts and entertainment. So those are the four kind of categories that these neighbors, if you will, will fall under. All right, so let's start with this fellow right here. Uh, obviously he's not from Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania didn't exist when he was born and well into his adulthood. His name is George Washington. 
Some of you may have seen these circular blue signs. In fact, uh, they're all over Western Pennsylvania and some of the major roads like Route 19, which is not too far from you folks at the library. And so that's Washington's trail. In 1753, Washington was delegated by the governor. Actually, he was the lieutenant governor of Virginia, uh, but the real governor was back in England. So this is the man who was kind of in charge of things. And his name was Robert Dinwiddie. And he sent George Washington, who was the younger brother of Lawrence Washington. And it just so happened that Lawrence and Dinwiddie and many other Fairfaxes and other wealthy Virginians had started a group called the Ohio Company. And what we today call Western Pennsylvania was claimed by both Pennsylvania and Virginia colonies but it was also claimed by the French. And the French in 1753 had begun to build a series of forts, starting at Presque Isle and then Leboeuf, and then what we now call Venango, um, that was Fort Machop. And then eventually they're gonna come down to what we today call Pittsburgh, but they, that's not happening yet. They've gone as far as Fort Leboeuf in 1753. And so Dinwiddie sends Washington with a letter telling the French basically to get out of his territory, which was Virginia. Washington does this. It becomes known as Washington's Trail today. It's a commemorative trail. But when he got there with the help of Christopher Gist, a local guide from uh, this region, uh, he delivers his letter to the French. And I often want to think to myself about this, this meeting, you know, knock on the door of the fort and deliver a letter saying, you guys have to leave. And the French commander probably looked behind Washington and Gist and said, um, you and who else is going to enforce this? But in any case, uh, didn't work. So Washington went back to Virginia to deliver this news that the French weren't leaving. This is going to be the beginning of what we now refer to in history books as the French and Indian War. And ultimately in Europe and across the world, Winston Churchill, in fact, referred to it as the first world war because it was a global conflict. It was the Seven Years War, known as in England itself. So Washington, meanwhile, on his way back from this trip, before he got to Virginia, on his way back, they met up, he and Gist met up with an Indian who promised to show them a shortcut. And as they were walking along the trail, they began to get suspicious of this Indian who'd gotten quite a bit ahead of them. And he turned around and he fired at Washington. That is going to be the first of six times that George Washington is almost going to die in West Pennsylvania, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. But he came close to dying five times illustrated here and, and one other incident as well. Um, so the Indian missed and they eventually let the Indian go so that he could give the other Indians wrong information about where they were going to go. So he got down to what we today call Pittsburgh and there's an area in Pittsburgh called Washington's Crossing. It's named that because Ian Gist put together a little man-made raft and they start going across the river uh, and they fell in and they had to get to an, a little, uh, part of the land that was in the middle of the river and they dried themselves out, but he almost drowned in the middle of the Allegheny River. Eventually gets back to Virginia. The governor then orders him to go north again with a group of militia to drive the French out. Ultimately, what happens there is there's a, a, a skirmish at Jamonville Glen, which Washington again could have been killed. And then he's going to be, um, long story short, he's gonna have to retreat to a place called Fort Necessity which he had built just in case that happened. The French come, surround them. Washington has to surrender. So there was a whole battle that happened there. He could have been killed. He gets back to Virginia only after he signs a document, basically admitting that he killed the French commander at the Jamonville Glen encounter. And so now they send another army, a regular British army under Edward Braddock. Washington goes along as the guide. And in Braddock's defeat, which took place near modern-day Kennywood and Edgar Thompson Steelworks, uh, Washington had uh, his horse shot out from him. And at the end of the battle, he counted five bullet holes in his frock coat and one in his hat. And then at Fort Ligonier, with John Forbes coming across from Philadelphia, after Braddock was defeated, another army three years later comes across and drives the French out. But at Fort Ligonier, Washington almost dies again, getting in between two British groups that mistakenly uh, were firing at each other because they didn't realize it. 
So all of those things could have resulted in the death of George Washington. And it happened right here in our backyard, which is really incredible. Well, let's move on now to modern American history. We're going to leave George and the colonial days. And we're going to look to the 1800s because now after the French and Indian War, this is when we have the beginnings of the foundation of Pittsburgh and the real settlement of Western Pennsylvania. So by 1800, Pittsburgh has developed into a small town and there's some outcroppings that are going to begin to develop, one of which is today known as Lawrenceville. That was created by Stephen Collins Foster's father. He named it Lawrenceville after the commander of the USS Chesapeake, who had died during the War of 1812. And uh, he uttered the famous phrase, don't give up the ship. And his name was James Lawrence. So this is where Stephen Collins Foster was born. He becomes one of the most famous songwriters in American history. In fact, most uh, musical historians consider him to be the greatest folk song writer in our history. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard of many of his uh, you know, compositions, Camp Town Races, O Susanna, and so on. But one of the more interesting uh, little tidbits about Stephen Foster is that he is responsible for two out of the 50 states, two of the state songs in the United States. And he wrote them both. Anybody want to unmute and name either one of them? You see an illustration in the top left and the bottom right. Top left is the more well-known. No guesses out there? I'm sure you might have heard of my old Kentucky home. Ironically, he only visited Kentucky one time in his life. It was on his honeymoon. But for some reason, he wrote this song about his old Kentucky home. On the bottom right is an illustration of Suwannee River. Kentucky home, of course, is, you know, Kentucky. But does anybody know where Suwannee River comes in? What state are we talking about here? Any guesses? Not hearing anything right away? Florida. That is the state song of Florida. All right. So there we go. And let's move on now to Mary Cassatt. By the way, all of these people are in order of their birth dates. Okay. So the actual events may or may not be chronological, but that's how I've uh, organized the program. And you'll see the topics jump all over the place as far as those four topics. So Mary Cassatt, obviously, in the art world, is a very, very famous painter. She was originally from Allegheny City, which is today the north side of Pittsburgh. And so born in 1844, she only lived here for a few years. And as a very young girl, her family moved to France. And she spent most of her adult life in Paris, uh, became a very good friend of Edward Degas and herself a very well-known um, impressionist painter, although very realistic, even though she was, you know, in that milieu of the impressionists, hers were much more realistic than some of theirs were in terms of the illustration. You can see clearly in these two. Her favorite theme of all of her artwork seems to have been women and in particular mothers and children. So that's what she became famous for. In 1859, uh, this house becomes very famous, or at least the town that it is associated with uh, becomes very famous. This is Titusville, Pennsylvania. And that is the home uh, for most of her younger days of a woman named Ida Tarbell. This is where she was born. And she went to high school at Titusville High School. And so... The family actually moved to Titusville to get in on the oil boom. Her father, Franklin Tarbell, was a barrel maker at one time. And then he got into actually, uh, you know, exploring for oil and more to the point, uh, shipping oil. And so he, he set up a pretty good business for himself and had this house built. And so it's associated with the oil days. Now, eventually what happens is, that a fellow named John Rockefeller, who is pictured here in the bottom right, is going to begin to gobble up all of the small oil companies 
over the period of time of the decade after the original oil boom in 1859 up until 1870. And then he's going to form in this year, the Standard Oil Trust. And it actually had an office in uh, Oil City at one time, it's still there. The building is still there where his office was. And so he begins to gobble up all of the competitors. And one of the people that he kind of swindled out of his business was Franklin Tarbell. And Ida never forgot it. And so as she grew up, she went to Allegheny College, got a good education, and eventually she becomes a journalist. From 1902 until 1904, she is going to write a series of articles that were published in McClure's magazine. Eventually, those are going to be gathered together, and they form what will become known as the History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida Tarbell. She essentially creates, along with a few other people, what we today call muckraking journalism, investigative journalism. And as a result, interestingly enough, this book is largely responsible for the fact that in 1911, the Standard Oil Trust was broken up by the United States government, largely because of the expose written by Ida Tarbell. Moving on now to 1889, you're looking, of course, at the world famous Eiffel Tower in Paris. And it was during that year that we have the Exposition Universelle. It was the World's Fair in Paris in that year. Well, a couple of years later, the World's Fair is going to be held in Chicago. And what the organizers of that fair decide that they want to do is to out Eiffel Eiffel. And so they put out uh, the word to all of the engineers in America to try and come up with something even greater than the Eiffel Tower. And this man from Allegheny City on the north side of Pittsburgh, whose house is illustrated right there. It's in the Mexican War Street's neighborhood. Still there. There's a little plaque right beside the red door right there. That's George Ferris's house. Everybody, I'm sure, in this audience knows that what he invented was greater than the Eiffel Tower, although it wasn't nearly as tall, but it was movable. And so, of course, this became the sensation of the Columbian Exposition, as it was known, in Chicago. It was supposed to open in 1892. They had a lot of delays. And so the exposition really kind of gets rolling in 1893. But this is an illustration of the Ferris wheel. It was gigantic. From the top of the Ferris wheel, you could see the entire World's Fair and most of the city of Chicago, if not all of it. Uh, you could see a good ways out the, the lake. And so it was just an incredible thing. And people rode this by the thousands, by the tens of thousands during the course of the fair, which lasted um, not quite a year. In any case, if you look carefully at this, uh, you will notice that this does not have the kind of cars that we associate with Ferris wheels. They're not individual cars that might hold two or three people. They actually look like this. They are small houses. And there are 36 of these small houses on this gigantic Ferris wheel. So think about this. Each of those gondolas can hold 60 passengers at full capacity. Now, they didn't often put that many people on there, but they could have. 60. Do the math. And the first Ferris wheel was able to hold 2,160 riders at the same time. It took 20 minutes to load and then it would do one or two revolutions very, very slowly, uh, and then it would unload. And so it was really an incredible structure. Um, and of course, today, ironically, of all things, about 25 years ago, Pennywood Park got rid of the Ferris wheel, which I, to this day, have never been able to understand how we can get rid of the one thing that represents a Pittsburgh amusement park ride of worldwide fame. But in any case, that's the story of the Ferris wheel. So we're going to move on now to a woman named Elizabeth Cochran. 
and she was born and raised in Cochran's Mills, PA, which is in Armstrong County, 1864. And we've actually met her a few minutes ago. Her name is Nellie Bly. That is her pen name. She becomes a journalist. And so she does some stories under this nom de plume of Nellie Bly. Uh, it was actually a character in a story. And so that is an illustration on the left of Nellie greeting people coming into the Pittsburgh International Airport. That uh, statue was added just a couple of years ago from the Heinz History Center collection. And that's actually the outfit that she wore on her most famous ex expedition. Uh, she became well-known, though, uh, in Pittsburgh. She actually started writing but she got tired of dog shows and writing uh, about social events. She wanted to do real journalism. And so she went to New York and she met up with and convinced Joseph Pulitzer to hire her as a reporter. And her first big expose was 10 days in a madhouse. She got herself um, put into an insane asylum and she then came out and wrote a story, a scathing expose of it. And as a result of which, she is going to make a name for herself as a journalist. And so now she proposes an even greater stunt. And this is what it became known as stunt journalism to Pulitzer. She said, I want to try and recreate what never had happened in real life, but was imagined in a novel called Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. She wants to try and actually do this. And in 1888, she does set off to go around the world and by the time she was halfway across the world, uh, all over the world, people were following this story. Could she do it in 80 days? She did better than that. She went around the world and got back to New York in 72 days. And so she becomes a world famous journalist because of this. Interesting sidelight here. In 2002, the United States Post Office issued a commemorative stamp collection of famous women in journalism. This is out of the entire history of this country and all the women who have ever worked for newspapers or in journalism, and they picked four to make stamps of. And I want to call your attention to the right side of that set of stamps. Ida Tarbell and Nellie Bly from Western PA are part of that set of four. George Marshall. 1880, born in Uniontown, PA, eventually is going to rise through the ranks of the United States Armed Forces. And during World War II, he will be the U.S. Army Chief of Staff. Among other great decisions that he makes is appointing the man on the left in the picture, and that is Dwight Eisenhower as the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. Marshall was the guy, though, in Washington who is really going to call the shots of how World War II will be fought by the United States Armed Forces all over the world, Europe and the Pacific. After the war, he is going to become equally famous. He's now not only helped win the war, and in fact, Winston Churchill said he was the architect of victory, Marshall. And not only does he do that, but then he becomes Secretary of State under Harry Truman. And in 1947, he, along with many other people in the State Department and the president, are going to develop what we today call the Marshall Plan. It was the European recovery plan. And I think it could be argued, and maybe not even argued, that Marshall and Truman and the other people involved in this saved the world from chaos uh, and the threat of communism after World War II. We go on now to Martha Graham, back to the arts world. And she is going to become legendary in the world of arts. She is going to completely revolutionize dance in the world. Uh, she started out as a ballet dancer, but she very quickly developed a completely different form of dance. She started a company called the Martha Graham Dance Company that is still active to this day. The illustration right there on the right side is of them today doing a performance. That is an illustration of Martha. Uh, around age 50, and she was a great, uh, also from Allegheny City, the north side. Now, she actually is going to be a composer of ballets. She's going to compose over 100 of them, and many times she would collaborate with very famous composers 
on these ballets and you know have them commissioned to do the music she is going to have such a collaboration with Aaron Copland very very famous american composer maybe the most famous american musician and composer of orchestral works and in 1944 they are going to work on uh, a ballet which goes through various modifications and it kept changing so much that Aaron Copland simply titled it Ballet for Martha. When it was finally finished and premiered in 1945, it became a sensation. And many of you may be familiar with it by a different name. It is called Appalachian Spring. That was Martha Graham who developed that project with Aaron Copland, which is just amazing to me. Rachel Carson, 1907 from Springdale, PA. Originally a biologist, uh, eventually becomes a best-selling author of three books about the ocean and the world of water that we all uh, inhabit here. Most of our globe is water. And later on, after she becomes famous for that series of books, she's going to write an even more important and seminal book called Silent Spring in 1962. She becomes very concerned about pesticides and the chemicals that we are using in all kinds of ways and poisoning our world. She is directly responsible for the elimination of DDT, and many people consider her to be the mother of the modern environmental movement in this country. Jimmy Stewart, 1908, probably one of the most famous of all of the people in our program right here. And so you see him standing to the far right in front of the hardware store the Stewart Company Hardware Store in Indiana, PA, where he's going to grow up. Naturally, of course, we all know him, not from working in a hardware store, but for his acting. He's going to go to college. Uh, he went to college to actually become, uh, it's gone right out of my head. Uh, but in any case, he was going to get into science. And so he, though, finds a love of acting in college. He also finds a love of airplanes. That was something that he had from a, from boyhood. And in fact, he's going to become a pilot very young in his career as an actor. And so more importantly, though, in our purposes here, he is going to be one of the best known actors in the history of Hollywood. Ultimately, he will be named by the American Film Institute, which is the source for ratings of all types about film. He will be number three of the greatest male performers in the history of Hollywood. So that is pretty high praise. Uh, Jimmy Stewart had an incredible range. He had a fantastic comedic ability, but he also had a dramatic uh, sense that was just, you know, out of this world. Here you see some of his early work. Uh, he goes to Hollywood in the 1930s with a friend of his. Uh, they actually lived together for a while. You might have heard of him. His name is Henry Fonda. But in any case, uh, the two of them are going to have a career that is going to span decades um, and collaborated only a couple of times, but lifelong friends. 1939, by that time, Jimmy Stewart is beginning to establish himself. Frank Capra is the man who is going to really make Stewart a household name in this country. And Mr. Smith goes to Washington in 1939 is going to put Stewart now at the top of the billing uh, for the first time. He was nominated for an Academy Award, an Oscar in 1939, follows that up in 1940 as the co-star of the Philadelphia story uh, with Katherine Hepburn, who's the one who actually developed the project, but along with Cary Grant. Uh, Stewart, of course, is the leading man considered to be in that story. And so he does, he does win his only Oscar, 1940 for The Philadelphia Story. And then everything changes for Jimmy Stewart. Uh, by 1941-42, of course, the United States is now uh, involved in World War II. Jimmy Stewart is going to answer the call to duty. And as I mentioned in earlier, he had an interest in aviation, and he had been a licensed pilot ever since the early 1930s. And by this time, early 1940s, he actually owned his own plane for several years. 
And so obviously he's a great candidate to be a pilot in the Army Air Corps. And so by 1943, when this photograph is taken, Stuart is serving in England as a captain and a bomber pilot in B-24s uh, bombing Germany at that time. Fantastic book if you want to read about Stuart in general, but mostly focusing on his time uh, in the service. This book is called Mission, and it's written by Robert Motston. And it's just uh, an, a really different take on Jimmy Stewart, which most of us have never really understood how that affected his life later on. By 1944, Stewart has risen through the ranks of the Army Air Corps to the point where he is now a wing commander. He's no longer a pilot and just, you know, uh, a squadron. Uh, he now commands an entire wing, which is hundreds of men and dozens of planes. And so he is now a colonel in the United States Army Air Corps. By 1945, of course, the war ends. Jimmy Stewart has come back home. Uh, he's having a, a lot of trouble in the time after the war, kind of reestablishing himself. He really doesn't, as many, many veterans did at the time and, and in any war, um, putting your life back together. And so Stuart is kind of fumbling around a bit, and he's rescued uh, by Frank Capra, who suggests to him that there's a movie that he might be a good fit for. And so it's called It's a Wonderful Life. He was nominated for an Oscar for playing George Bailey in this movie in 1946, but what's really interesting about this film is that Robert Matson has suggested and other people have agreed with him that the Jimmy Stewart of 1940 could not have done this movie. He psychologically, his wartime service and the life and death decisions that he was making during the war changed him dramatically as a human being. And it made it possible for him to understand George Bailey on a visceral level that he may never have been able to do before. And so this was a part that was made for him. Uh, in fact, it wasn't really all that successful at the time. Today, it's considered a classic, but um, it was you know, not a box office success, although it was he was uh, nominated for an Oscar for that role. He goes on, of course, to star in literally dozens and dozens of high-profile films, worked with great directors all during his career. Uh, these are just some of the more famous movies. He is best known probably in terms of categories for his westerns. The most famous of them is perhaps uh, Winchester 73. But in any case, he did you know many, many westerns. Uh, as I said before, he has a great comic ability as he showed in the Philadelphia story. Uh, but Harvey was probably his his famous, uh, most famous comedic role as uh, Edward Dowd, uh, who had an imaginary friend in 1954. And again, in 1958, Stewart is going to um, be aligned with Alfred Hitchcock in two of Hitchcock's most famous films, Rear Window and Vertigo. And by 1965, uh, Stewart is still an A-list actor, and he is hired as the lead character in Shenandoah, which is set during the time of the Civil War. So Jimmy Stewart has, you know, a, a, just a tremendous career from the 1930s well into the 1970s, and not to the, say the least, considered to be one of the greatest actors in our history, as I indicated earlier. Speaking of actors... Uh, from Western Pennsylvania, from Pittsburgh, PA, we have Gene Kelly. And of course, he's not so much well known for his acting, although he was quite good, uh, but he's known for his dancing. Gene Kelly, like Martha Stewart, is going to revolutionize dance. She did so for women. Uh, her style of dance was not light and feathery. It was more grounded, more earthy than previous dance styles. And it became very, very popular, and it, it is to this day. Gene Kelly did much the same thing for men, and perhaps even more so, because, of course, everybody was able to associate women with dancing. But men, not so much. Uh, it was considered to be effeminate. And Gene Kelly is the man who changes all of that. 
because his style of dance was incredibly athletic. Uh, he could hold his own against people who did traditional dance like Fred Astaire, his contemporary, but he had a very different style, very much physical in his dance. And probably no performance that Kelly did is more emblematic of that style than Singing in the Rain, which is a tremendous uh, accomplishment, the, that scene. Uh, you'll read different sources that'll say that was shot in one take. It was not. Um, it was shot in several takes, but it took days to do it. And so it's just an incredible scene, one of my favorites of all time in musical theater. So that one he is most associated with, but uh, it's only one of the two that he is known for as far as films, film musicals. Gene Kelly has two of the top 10 all-time greatest movie musicals in history. Singing in the Rain is number one on the list of the greatest musicals in American film history. The other one is number nine. And I don't know if anybody wants to try and share quickly what they think that one might be. Any quick answers out there? I'll give you a hint. That's Leslie Caron next to him. All right. Uh, we'll go with American in Paris. And I'm assuming that you folks can unmute yourself. Uh, maybe I'm making a mistake in assuming that. In any case, this photograph right here gives me chills as I'm sitting here looking at it. I don't know how many of you have the hair rising on the back of your neck right now. I'm sure many of you, depending on your age, will recognize that. Uh, depending on your age, though, you may not have a clue what this is because you didn't grow up in this world. It's not something that exists in your life experience. This, of course, for those of you who do know what we're looking at, is a polio um, hospital. And these people are, for the remainder of their lives, going to spend most, if not all, of their waking moments and, and sleeping moments as well in what are called iron lungs because they have been stricken with polio and they have it bad enough that they cannot breathe on their own. Polio is a crippling disease that incapacitates various parts of your body. And depending on the severity of it, this may be your existence ever after. Uh, if you're lucky, and I say that um, not jokingly at all, uh, this may be as bad as it gets for you, that you have to wear crutches and braces in order to stand and walk. Of course, the most famous of all the people in our history who had polio was Franklin Roosevelt, who contracted it, this is rather unusual, as an adult. He was well into his uh, 30s at the time that he contracted polio. Interesting little sidelight here, there are almost no photographs of Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair. If you're looking at two of what may be five total. I've never found the other three, but I've been told by guides at the Hyde Park Museum, uh, the Roosevelt uh, Library, that there may be a handful, like five. And that's incredible to think about for as long as Roosevelt, frankly, was a public figure, much less president for 12 years. And there's five photographs of him in a wheelchair. There's very few photographs of him with braces. You can see that one on the right. If you look carefully, you can see the braces under his pants. So it's, an, it's amazing to think about that in the world we live in today with 24 seven news cycles that the journalists of the time knew that Roosevelt had this uh, paralysis, but would not show it. It was an unwritten rule that you never take a picture of the president without his permission in this situation. And they abided by it. The March of Dimes, of course, is what brings us to the end of polio in, in some ways by raising all of this money. And not surprisingly, it was called the March of Dimes because Roosevelt was associated with the dime. And so that's how they got the name of this effort give dimes to the effort to fight polio. One of the most famous celebrities who was part of that drive, of course, is in the middle there, talking about somebody who served in our armed forces. Many people do not know that Elvis Presley did do that. But in any case, Jonas Salk is the man who's going to make this come true. 
originally from New York City. And uh, once he had established his career, he eventually comes here to Pittsburgh, gets a job at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And by 1955, he is going to develop a polio vaccine based on dead virus. Uh, there were many, many people who were skeptical of this. They did not believe that it would work. They were scared to death of it. Uh, but nevertheless, Salk, you know, insisted that this would be successful. You see here a photograph from 1954 of children actually being given the shots, the polio vaccine shots. And at the end of that year, when it became apparent that this vaccine was going to be successful, it had um, done what it was intended to do. Salk was actually named Time Magazine Man of the Year. <clears throat> uh, by the way, the Jonas Salk uh, Laboratory is uh, now open, I believe, I was told anyway, and I have an article about it, um, to the public. Uh, there is a, a way to actually go see the, the lab now. So we're going to move on now, and we're talking about this young man. His name was Michael Strank. Uh, most of you probably do not know him, although you know what he did. He was a sergeant in the Marines during World War II. Uh, as you can see from the dates there, he is only going to be 26 years old at the time of his death. And so he is famous for something that happened here in a location called Mount Suribachi in the Philippine and the uh, Pacific theater of World War II. This photographer, Joe Rosenthal, worked for the Associated Press. You can see his camera there. He is up on top of Mount Suribachi. And what's going to happen shortly after this photograph was taken by a different journalist is there's going to be a flag raising. And it was Joe Rosenthal who took this photograph that you're looking at right here probably the most famous photograph of World War II, maybe one of the most famous in the entire history of photojournalism, and that is the flag raising on Iwo Jima. It was actually the second flag that went up. The first one was too small, and the commander of the Marines down uh, at the beach said, some of our men can't see it, and so he told a group of uh, guys to get a bigger flag and a bigger flagpole and to go up the mountain and put it up. Michael Strank from Conema, PA, which is near Johnstown, was the leader of this squad of six men. He was the commander of those six men, and he is in that photograph, but he's not one of the ones that you can see very easily right here. That's him on the other side of this photograph. So he's right in the center. You'll notice if you look carefully at the uh, illustration of the six names there that Michael Strank, Franklin Sousley, and Henry Hansen are listed as dead. What that means is they will not survive the Battle of Iwo Jima. They raised the flag, and those three men, half of that squadron, did not live to go home. One other one was wounded very badly. This gives you a better close-up of the side of the statue, which you saw a moment ago. And uh, most of us know this from the statue, not even from the photograph alone. And so there is Michael Strank actually illustrated very close up. That is the statue that we are taking a look at photographs of. And that is in Arlington, Virginia. It is the Marine Corps Memorial. For years, it was referred to by many people as the World War II Memorial. It is not, and it never has been, the World War II Memorial. It is strictly a Marine Corps Memorial. Around the base of that memorial, all that small lettering that you can see going around the top, it looks almost like bunting. Uh, those are the names of all the battles that the Marines have fought in from the beginning of their history during the Revolution until the present day. And so that's what that memorial was set to commemorate. Henry Mancini is another of our famous artists here from Western Pennsylvania, from Aliquippa, PA. Uh, not born here, but raised here. His family moved here in the 1920s. And so Henry Mancini, of course, most famous for the character on the left, uh, did the theme song from, of course, The Pink Panther his most famous work, but not the work that made him famous as a composer. That was actually an earlier uh, 
score that was done for a show, actually a television show. And it's in the middle of those three right there. It's Peter Gunn. Mancini is going to write the theme music for the Peter Gunn show, uh, detective show. And uh, interesting little sidelight, there was a small group of studio musicians that did the original score, uh, the, the first version of Peter Gunn, the one that we all know and love that we're familiar with, actually conducted by Mancini. But the drummer in that little group of musicians was a fellow that was known as Curly at the time. Uh, if you see him today, he doesn't have much hair left, but you may recognize the name John Williams. And it's, yes, that John Williams, the composer of Jurassic Park and all of those other movie scores. Uh, but he played the drums for Peter Gunn. A couple of the other movies that were most famous uh, for Mancini, of course, Moon River, uh, Andy Williams' version of that, Days of Wine and Roses. Uh, you see there Audrey Hepburn from Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is where that song, Moon River, became famous. Andy Warhol another artist in Pittsburgh history from the city of Pittsburgh. He is, along with a few other people, really the inventor of a whole uh, type of art that we today refer to as pop art. And you see an example of there, a, a self-portrait that Warhol did, a photograph that he would then manipulate and turn into a work of art. Some of his most famous subjects, you might say, are here. Probably his most famous painting is the Campbell Soup Cans, which I've always kind of, you know, I, I'm not one who really probably appreciates modern art like I should. And so there are some things that I find confusing, you know, why some people find them so revolutionary. But in any case, it's an interesting painting, the Campbell Soup labels. But what Warhol also did was really change the world that we live in, in terms of entertainment. He kind of, along with a, a few others, but I think he was the leader in, in terms of celebrity, uh, the, the cult of celebrity that we have with us today. Warhol was fascinated by celebrities and photographed and turned works of art into, uh, or turned photographs into works of art of many, many of them. You can see three of the most famous here from 1964, Liz Taylor on the left and Jackie Kennedy on the right. And of course, I think probably his most famous celebrity subject was Marilyn Monroe in one of many photographs that he manipulated in 1961. There were several others as well. But in any case, I think if you want to think of it this way, I suppose, this cult of celebrity is still with us as, as we know today. Uh, for any of you who are football fans, you know that the Kansas City Chiefs now have a whole tremendous new audience for their football games only within the last few months. And uh, that all has to do, of course, with the fact that many of those people now watching those football games who never watched them before also happen to be Swifties, Taylor Swift. But uh, if you want to really get to the bottom of, I think, what Warhol is responsible for, Taylor Swift has a tremendous amount of talent. Obviously, she's a, a, a fantastic artist. Uh, but I, I like to think of it in terms of Keeping up with the Cardassians, I think it's really Warhol that we have to thank for the Cardassian family being as famous as they are. I have yet to figure out what talents they have, or at least what they did when they became famous and why. Nowadays, it seems like they're pretty good at business. Um, but in any case, I was not too sure about that years ago. Well, the Andy Warhol Museum opened in 1994. If you haven't been there, I certainly suggest you do. Uh, I found it fascinating. I didn't know what to expect when I went there, uh, but it was really, really quite uh, something. And so that is, of course, on the north side of Pittsburgh near the stadiums. Speaking of Warhol and Carson, two of our uh, subjects, they, along with Roberto Clemente, are immortalized in the city of Pittsburgh on the Three Rivers city, uh, the three sister bridges, I'm sorry, uh, that are on the Allegheny River. They're called the sisters because they are identical. They are probably the most famous of all the bridges in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Pittsburgh has a lot of bridges. Matter of fact, we have more than Venice. And this is just the city. I'm not talking about Allegheny County. But the city of Pittsburgh has 446 bridges. 
imagine that. Oof. Uh, I don't want to be in charge of the uh, repairs. But in any case, the 7th Street Bridge and the 9th Street Bridge are now known as the Warhol Bridge and the Carson Bridge, named after two of our subjects here this evening. Get to our famous title subject, Fred McFeely Rogers. That's where they get the Mr. McFeely character from. That's his middle name. Born in the Trobe, PA, uh, moves away for a while and attends college. Comes back here to Pittsburgh in 1954 after getting involved in television. And he is going to be one of the founding um, actors, if you will, and producers at WQED, Public TV, in Pittsburgh, PA. And of course, he does a number of different shows. One of the shows that he was very instrumental in was shared with someone from Butler, which is where I'm from. And her name was Josie Carey. She created a program called Children's Corner. And Fred Rogers was the behind the scenes guy for Children's Corner. Josie Carey was the host of it. And out of that comes some of the more famous elements that later become part of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. For instance, the puppets. Um, you can see some of them there. Daniel Striped Tiger, X the Owl, and so on. King Friday. Those are all originally part of the Children's Corner and then they become part of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood later on. She's also going to be a composer, and Fred Rogers and Josie Carey are going to collaborate on many different um, works of uh, songs and lyrics. Uh, Fred would do the, the music, and I have a wonderful quote. This is my favorite quote of this program. Carey once remarked on this collaboration, he would make me very angry because I would labor over my lyrics for days and Fred would sit at the piano and what took me hours and hours and hours he would put to music in four minutes <laughs> so she just couldn't stand the fact that you know he was able to put that together in such a rapid fashion what did that take amazing amount of talent of course he's going to do the neighborhood of Mr. Uh, of, uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood from 1966 until 2001 895 episodes of The Neighborhood. And there you see the famous trolley and some of the other characters. 2009, Mr. Rogers donated a sweater to the Smithsonian. Two things about his sweaters, which I find fascinating. First of all, he was colorblind. And so someone on the production crew would have to tell him what sweater he was about to put on because he had no idea what color they were. And there were a number of different sweaters. They were all almost identical, uh, but they were different colors and they were all made by his mother. She knitted his sweaters, his cardigans. And so oh. imagine that. There he is on the banks of the rivers down by the point. That was in 2009 that we have that statue down there. Heinz History Center has the original set of the Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And so you can visit that to this day down there at the History Center. David McCullough, probably the most famous author ever to come out of Western Pennsylvania and one of the greatest historians in all of American history, quite frankly. He is going to do several stories about Western Pennsylvania. One of them is the story of the Brooklyn Bridge, which was invented by a man named, designed by a man named John Roebling, who settled in Saxonburg, in fact, named the town, and developed wire rope um, right now, they're trying to save the wire rope shop, the little studio that uh, Roebling developed, this world-famous steel cable, iron cable, that put that bridge up. But McCullough wrote the book on the Great Bridge. I uh, also wrote one on the Johnstown Flood. In fact, that, that was his first major hit as a historian. He's going to write many, many others, as you can see here. Panama Canal, The Path Between the Seas, John Adams, which was turned into a miniseries, 1776, Biography of Teddy Roosevelt, Mornings on Horseback, and the Wright Brothers, and several others. Uh, just an incredible talent and a wonderful speaker. I've heard David McCullough a couple of times, and he's just mesmerizing. I could sit and listen to him for hours. Unfortunately, of course, we lost him uh, just about a year or so ago, 2022. We're going to end our program today 
by going to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and you are looking at the storefront that becomes the Cascade Theater in Newcastle in 1903. There is an immigrant family that has come to the United States and film motion pictures are new at this time. And so we have these little theaters in these different towns and Newcastle had this one called the Cascade, which was opened by these four brothers who came you know, with their family to America. Eventually, they're going to become so successful in Newcastle that they are going to decide to take their company and move west. About 20 years after they started their business in Newcastle, they pick up and they move west to California. Uh, you see them here from left to right, Harry, Albert, Sam, and Jack. If you can unmute, somebody do that and tell me who we're looking at. Is it Warner Brothers? It is indeed. That is the Warner Brothers. There they are, right there. Newcastle, Pennsylvania is where they started. And uh, of course, the legend of the Warner Brothers is created in Burbank, California. And to this day, Warner Brothers is still one of the great movie uh, companies in the world. Now, I don't know about my audience, but I know I had a great familiarity with Warner Brothers. I spent almost every Saturday morning from the time I was probably three or four years old until well into my teens with Warner Brothers because this would be some of the characters that are most associated with Warner Brothers. And I would spend literally hours watching Looney Tunes on Saturday mornings when that was one of the only things that you could get on TV when you only had four channels. But uh, great, great. You know, look at those characters. I mean, they're, they're just fantastic. Very, very funny. And that brings us to the end of our program, of course. And so I thought it would be perfectly appropriate to end with this slide. Speaking of Looney Tunes, of course, we have Porky Pig indicating that that's all, folks. And with that, I will stop talking. And we will now entertain some questions from our audience. As I said here, there's my information, the history of hobo. And I found out the other day, I'm actually, if you type that into Google, I now actually come up as the first or second hit. So I must be doing something right because I'm getting some attention out there. In any case, thanks very much for having me this evening. And I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the program and maybe learned a few things you didn't know before about some of our famous neighbors here in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, if anyone has questions, you can feel free to yeah. unmute and ask. I'll hang around as long as we've got an audience, whether it's 15 or one. Did Disney, did Disney come first or, or these Looney Tunes? That is a good question in terms of Looney Tunes. That's a great question, actually. I don't know when they developed those characters. Walt Disney, um, Steamboat Willie was 1926 or 7. No, Steamboat Willie must be earlier than that because, well, maybe not. Yeah, I think that was in the mid-20s, 26, 27. So that was his first like hit character. It wasn't the first thing he developed, but it was the first thing that was uh, became famous under his name. He had lost control of his earlier company and his earlier characters that he had developed. So I would say that time period, I'm going to say, I don't know, the Warner Brothers, probably Disney first, because they only got out to Burbank in 1923, I guess it was. So yeah, they probably took a few years before they developed some of those iconic characters that we just saw. Great question though. I'm going to have to look that up. Do you know where the Ferris wheel was built? It was built on site. Um, and then it was taken apart. <laughs> and then it was rebuilt in St. Louis uh, a couple of years later. It was rebuilt, I think, one more time, and then it disappeared. It basically was scrapped 
as best anybody can figure out. Nobody's really quite sure where it went. Somebody claimed that they found the axle in a barn. Um, I need to find that article again and see if that really was true. Wow. But uh, as far as I know, the Ferris wheel basically disappeared. But yeah, it was built on site. In fact, <laughs> when they started actual construction of it, you know, it was bad enough looking at it in the drawings. But the people who were in charge of the fair were terrified of this thing. I mean, they they were they were thrilled with the idea, but they were terrified that this thing was not going to stand up. <laughs> it was going to fall down, you know, because um, it is, you know, almost 200 feet high. And um, it, interesting backstory. There's a new book that just came out. The, the gentleman who's in charge of the archives at, at Pitt University, young man I met last uh, two summers ago. Uh, Josh Brandt, uh, he wrote a book about the the uh, from from the Steel City to the White City, and it was all the Pittsburgh connections at the World's Fair. He will and actually be uh, with us in two weeks if anyone is interested. <laughs> did I get the name right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Broad, Josh Broad. Uh, yeah, fan I've got the book. I, I went to a book talk that he gave down at Pitt University a, a few weeks ago. And I bought the book, so I, I'm I'm starting my way through it. But yeah, fantastic connections. I urge everybody to sign up for that one and attend that program because you will learn some really fantastic things. I'm glad you said something, Katie, because I don't want to steal his thunder. There was another plan before they came up with the Ferris wheel. And I'll just give give you a little bit of a hint. It didn't work out. And so they were suddenly stuck without anything. <laughs> and so even though this this idea that Ferris came up with terrified them, they had to go with it because they had nothing else that they could come up with. And uh, so they did. They went with it. They built it. And the rest is history. What kind of a, a thing was the one that didn't work out? It was another structure that was going to go. It was going to be a skyscraper type of structure. There's some famous names associated with it, and that's why I don't want to steal it. Oh, okay. And it's the, the whole reason why it wasn't built is quite fascinating, too. It's an interesting story. I put the link to the um, calendar event for that if anyone is interested. Good. Good. I'm going to sign up for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be a really good one. Yeah, because he he did an interview talk there where he was asked questions. So if he's actually just going to do it, I'm not sure if he'll do the same thing or not, but mm -hmm. uh, if he's going to do just a straight presentation, it could be very different than what I saw. So yep, there's some really, is. really fascinating stories about, you know, Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. I was very excited when I heard about his book. So very excited for his talk. And I thought it tied in really nicely. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When I met him two years ago, it was because of a homestead workshop. We did a homestead steel strike workshop for an entire week, University of Pittsburgh. And um, he was writing the book then. And so he and I had a chance to talk about it. It's like, okay, the minute you get this done, I want to hear about it. And somebody sent me an email and said, he's going to do this talk. So I was like, okay, I'm there. Yep. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, I'll be glad to stick around as long as people want to ask. Maybe some people are hoping for some other questions they can listen to. I always do that too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, well for those you, of you who are yeah, remaining gonna... <laughs> with us, thank you once again for coming to the program and uh, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. I learned a lot. If you uh, think yeah, of questions you. after, very you can welcome. always email me or email Steve. He had his uh, information there. So I'll be sending out the recording for anyone who wanted to go back and watch. Um, and if you need his information, I'll include it in the email as well. So thank you, everyone. And thank you All so right. much, Steve. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.